I'm Jeff Smith and welcome to the secrets of success. Throughout my life, I've been fascinated by one single question and it's how do successful people become successful? What is it that makes that big difference in our lives? Over the last 40 years, I've interviewed rich people, famous people, and many millionaires to find out their secrets of success, and my aim is to share them here with you. Of course, success is not always measured in money, and in these programs, I'm looking at many different success stories from people in all walks of life. I want to find out what makes them tick how they overcame adversity to keep on going, and I want to extract those magical nuggets of wisdom so that you too can implement the secrets of success into your own life. In today's episode, I'm talking with Dr. Cory Block. Cory is a leading expert in business strategy, organizational behavior, and leadership. He's the Professor of Strategic Management at Monarch Business School in Switzerland and a Forbes Certified Executive Coach. He has over 25 years experience in coaching and training and has worked more than 150 companies such as Microsoft, Emirates Airlines and the United Nations. If that's not enough, he's also the author of two acclaimed books, the first one being Spartan CEO, Six Pillars of Executive Performance, and the second one is Business is Personal, a blueprint for finding meaning at work. This is going to be a story of personal development intertwined with business development to explain what you are capable of achieving and of course how to achieve it so let's bring in the amazing man himself welcome to the show dr cory block thank you so much jeff you know we were we were saying uh thank you so much i'm so excited to be here we were saying it was it, it's taken us almost six months to finally get this because people with like your schedule and my schedule were impossible it's like trying to get two bullets to intersect in the air five miles from here. It's know? been, it's so. been insane, insane. Yeah, been As different. you say, six months. And even <laughs> when, I mean, you're in Dubai right now, right? Yes, that's great. I, I'm in England, so I'm a couple of hours north of London. But <laughs> earlier in the month, I was in Dubai for three weeks. Nice. And I said, yeah, hey, hey, Korea, I'm in <laughs> Dubai. And, and, but I, I was working with a client out there and you messaged me and you said, yeah, I'm in JBI. I'm at the Hilton Hotel. That's yeah. like 20 meters away from the yeah. apartment I was staying in. And, <laughs> but Still I wasn't there. So I said, hold it there. I'll hold it there. When I finish today, I'll come over. We finally have to meet. Uh, no. But by the time I got there, you had to I go. And so yeah. <laughs> we missed each other again. So yeah. eventually we are here. We have made it. Yeah. So you're yeah. looking good. How are you doing, my friend? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm actually really good. I had a really serious illness. My wife and I came back from a, um, a trip out to Miami and we landed in Dubai and got really bad food poisoning, some sort of viral food poisoning and it knocked us out for like five days. And then after that, I had to fly to Canada to attend my grandfather's funeral. So I was like, without, oh, no, it's okay. He was 97 years old. Don't worry. He lived an amazing life. Okay. Like it was, I've never been to a funeral with so much laughter and joy. Like we, there was 75 of us, just immediate family. Okay. He's got 60 grandkids. Wow. Nothing sad about that. He did an amazing <laughs> job. Wow. I think it's wonderful when there's a funeral. <laughs> like you say, is a celebration of that oh, yeah. person's life. Oh, then, I've, I've told my, my kids already, look, don't feel bad for me. If anything happens, I've already lived four lifetimes. I swear to you, I have had more experience than is, than is due any human. And I have had an amazing, amazing time. Okay, well, we're going to find out <laughs> about some of those things. Those, li those four lifetimes, not all of them have been good. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll find out about that as yeah. well. But I want to yeah, find yeah. out about your four lifetimes and your books. But before we do that, sure. I want to find out more about you, Corey. I like to find out about the person when they were young in their formative mm. years. So I have three questions for you. Sure. <laughs> Where were you born? What was life like for you as a child? 
And what were your dreams and aspirations as you were growing up? Uh, when I was, I was born in Calgary in Canada. I was born in cold Canadian weather. And I think that's probably why I like the cold, but I can't explain why I don't like country music because Calgary is the home <laughs> of the stampede, right? The largest stampede. And so I, I should really have a love for country music, which I don't have. I'm kind of allergic to it emotionally. Uh, but I, <laughs> after living in, in Calgary, my, my father bounced around for work a little bit inside his, his company. He worked for the same company for 25 years, but in different cities. So we moved to Prince George for a while. And I remember as a young child, jumping off the roof of my house into the front yard, which had two meters of snow in it. And I, I don't think that would be considered safe parenting at the moment. I think with <laughs> the way the parenting has gone, I don't, I don't, I think my neighbors would have taken, would have had me taken away. But uh, yeah, I remember that. That was amazing. And I just remember as a child, really loving helping people. And that just sort of went all the way through into high school. I, I skipped a good deal of, of high school because I was bored. I graduated with honors and I think about a hundred missed classes. And, uh, and that's because I was bored in school and I would spend that extra time sitting and helping, uh, helping my friends, tutoring people, counseling people. And that ended up being part of the foundation of my, my career. Okay, so you were bored, you missed classes, but you still came <laughs> yeah. out with honours. So yeah. have you got natural aptitude for academia or did you just okay. work your ass off in your free time? No, no, I have a natural aptitude for academia, but you, I would have never believed you if you had told me in my early 20s. See, I, I went to, to college, dropped out after about a year and a half, again, bored. But actually, the reason I dropped out is because I'd found what I was looking for. And she said yes. So we were going to get married. Uh, yeah, so I dropped out of college. Uh, my first wife and I, we got married and we were together for 23 years. I'm now with my second wife. We've been together for almost five years. And it, all, both of them amazing stories, really amazing stories. But yeah, so my in my early 20s, I had no need for academics. And so when I was 23, I was already uh, the inventory manager for the largest window production company in Canada, Star, Starline Windows. And uh, I had a lot of, we, we were making good money. My, my ex-wife and I were making good money, had a lot of great responsibility. And then my dad, actually, he, we were sitting in the backyard. I remember we were having a drink and he said, listen, he just said, he said, Corey, I've, I've worked in the same company for 25 years now. And I'm just not sure if I've wasted half of my life or not. And I thought, man, those are really bold words, right? Like, what do you do with that? And he said, don't worry. He says, listen, uh, all I want is, if you if you think you want to do something crazy with your life you should do it now while you're young and you have time to clean up the mess so my my first wife and i decided we would just sell everything move to the other side of the world and start businesses and then in the beginning of that uh those organizations founding we started five organizations there uh buried one exited four that was great but in the meantime i was voraciously reading everything i could and i was surrounding myself with mentors who were better than i was and by the time I was about 25, my, my mentors were adamant. All of them were singing the same song, Corey, you've got to go back to school. You've got to go back to school. And I said, no, 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 look, I've been successful already. There's nothing that school can teach me now uh, that I can benefit from. And they said, no, listen, you need to go and learn the language that will help you to describe why you've been good at what you've been good at. And this was in the days before VCs, before accelerators, before incubators. And so, so to have that kind of organizational growth in those early years, especially in Estonia, which was like, I mean, it wasn't a third world country. It was an emerging country at that time. And the technocratic re revolution was just taking hold when I got there. So it was really fortunate timing that way. But yeah, so I, it wasn't until I was 26 that I finally conceded to my mentors and said, okay, listen, I'll take a, I'll take a master's in leadership if I can get in there. And uh, the short, a long story short, the, the school, they tested me in the GRE and I had to score a certain amount on the GRE test, which I made, which was a little bit surprising to me. But anyway, so they put me on permanent academic probation and they gave me, they brought me into this four year program in leadership, which I completed in 18 months with a 4.0 GPA and an extra eight credit thesis. And that was my very first indication that this might be a talent, not just oh, a skill. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you look at my LinkedIn profile, like you'll see all of my academic degrees, do not be impressed with any of them. I've done all of them on evenings and weekends. It's my hobby. 
I do it for fun. <laughs> <laughs> you do it for fun. Yeah. Right. Obviously, your superpower <laughs> or one of them for sure. Yeah. So, so when you were younger, what were, what were your dreams and aspirations as you were growing up? What did you want to become? I wanted to become an astronaut. I'm just kidding. Okay. I didn't want to become an astronaut. I really wanted to become a writer. I loved writing and still do. I love writing and I've written in a, in a number of different genres. I've written academic books and I've written dialogue books. I, whole, I have a whole collection of poetry that no one has ever seen. And I don't know if I'll ever share that publicly, but um, I really love to write because it always frustrated me as a child that I couldn't draw. I can't, I can't even draw a stick person without forgetting a limb, Jeff. It's really, it's terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can't draw uh, and I'm not a great singer and I, I'm pretty good at public speaking. So, and I think that all comes from my real art and my real color, which is words. I'm, I'm very, very good with words. Okay. So you've written, so let's talk about yeah. a couple of books that you have published that has been <laughs> right. into the world that you've allowed people to see. <laughs> so the first one, the first one, Spartan CEO, six pillars yeah. for executive performance. That's so, right. okay. So three <laughs> questions for you here. Sure. Why did you write it? Who is it for? And what will they get from it? <laughs> Brilliant questions. Okay, so I wrote it because I was irritated. Right? And I, was irri <laughs> <laughs> I was irritated, Jeff. I was irritated with my own clients. Uh, so this is the problem. So I, I've been in executive coaching for about a decade already by this time. And I have been collecting a tremendous amount of experience and information and data from, from coaching high level executives and organizations. And it just really bothered me that on one hand, I had this organization with an amazing CEOs, incredible leader and great manager, and great with time and great with people and like seemed to be really on the ball. And then in this other organization about the same size, I had this really terrible CEO who was horrible with people and terrible with resources and time. And it didn't seem like the, the obviously the job title doesn't matter at all. Right. And I had read everything that John Maxwell and Max Dupree and and Peter Drucker had ever written about management and leadership. And I, and I still felt like there was something missing in the behaviors that differentiated between high performing and low performing executives, especially in my own practice as as an executive coach. So I started to steward that information. And that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I really wanted to highlight what I felt were the six differentiators between the really, really great high performing executives and really mediocre or low performing executives. So, who, so that, who, that's why I did it. Okay, so who is it for? Who should read this? Yeah, anybody in a senior managerial position that wants to break into an executive role. Okay. Uh, yeah, these are the things that are going to matter on on the bottom line of your life. Obviously, there's like the, the statistics are that there's there's 23% fewer executive roles now than they're worth 30 years ago and they pay nine times more than they did then right so there's fewer executive roles to compete for, to compete for and they pay a lot more so the stakes are a lot higher so anybody who really wants to move into senior management or junior executive leadership deputy executive leadership or into that c-suite role there's going to be a lot more competition and the differentiators and drivers of your performance are going to be small things right behaviors attitudes uh, some positive psychology, some some uh, relational aspects of your work, your the way you curate competition, both for yourself and your organization. These are going to be differentiators for you, and uh, and that's how that's how executives are going to be raised. Okay, so the subtitle, the six pillars of executive yeah. performance. I guess you've mentioned a few of oh, them yeah. already. <laughs> so kick us off then. What are the yeah. six pillars, and why sure. should we care? Okay, number one fitness. And I'm not just talking going to the gym, I'm talking about physical, mental and organizational fitness. It's a, it's a biopsychosocial, physical, mental, environmental, biopsychosocial model for fitness. This you are a, a cognitively embodied machine, you have to take care of your physical health. And like, I don't know if you knew this, Jeff, but uh, some of the research that I uncovered in writing the book, I found out that uh, CEOs, or let's say companies, in the in the the S and P fifteen hundred that are led by CEOs who play golf are fifty seven percent less profitable than companies in the S and P fifteen hundred led by CEOs who run marathons, right? Even though golf and marathon are both you know they're both four hour sports, right? It takes a totally different kind of mental agility 
to uh, to run a marathon than it does to play golf. And so there's no there's no idea of causality. We don't know why it is that way. We just know that statistically that correlation is there. That if your CEO runs marathons regularly, you're going to make more money, right? So it's an interesting fact. And we don't know which you know comes first, the chicken or the egg on that. If it's you know high performing companies hire marathon running CEOs or marathon running CEOs lead higher performing companies, we don't know. Uh, but fitness is number one. Okay, I'll come back onto right? fitness, but I just want to pick yeah, up yeah. on golf. Sure. So up until 2015, I used to play golf two or three times a week. Oh, I was no, never I, any I, good I've, at it. I've, yeah, I've I, I, you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you haven't. You haven't. <laughs> I, I'm interested in statistics, right? So I, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, why has golf been chosen? But here we go. So playing mm -hmm. golf in the UK, you yeah. have a, you have a bag of golf clubs. You put them on your shoulder. And you yeah. walk that four hours. Yes. When I come to Dubai, the furthest I walk is from the golf buggy <laughs> to the tee. <laughs> and oh, back. Yeah. There's no walking. That's true. And, yes, yeah. That's true. And, and I've been, I've played golf in many places around the world and most of them have buggies. You don't yeah. need to be fit to play golf. It's not, it's not a fitness thing. That's so, right. so to compare <laughs> that to marathons, I would say here that the fitter you are, the more competent and able you are. I would definitely mm. agree with that without doubt. And it has a yeah. huge impact upon the mindset without doubt. In fact, I believe it so much today, this morning, I spoke with a doctor in New York and he's mm. coming on the show to talk about fitness at the executive wow. level. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So we're recording that later in the month. So that will be part of this, this series too. So uh, obviously you'll be interested in that. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But most people who play golf now sit in a buggy. I'd hardly call that <laughs> fitness. <laughs> okay, so yeah. number one, fitness. I totally agree yeah, with so you. Yeah, yeah, 100% fitness. Who you are, you are not disembodied from your body and who you are in your body affects the quality of decisions you make it's your 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 patience during negotiations your level-headedness uh, the amount of beta amyloids that are stuck in your brain stem when you wake up like all of these things are affected by your fitness so that's important second is confidence and confidence is super interesting because what i discovered was that confidence isn't a character trait it's not a personality trait right so you can't take a test on on the internet and it, it can't say, oh, you're a generally confident person. There's no such thing as a generally confident person, Jeff, because confidence is a skill. It is not a character trait. So for example, I'm, I'm a pretty good public speaker, right? I, I can stand on a stage in front of 3000 people, lights, camera, action, no problem. As long as I have my microphone and a clicker for my slide deck, I'm good, right? But if you just change one piece of that context, right? If you just take away my microphone and give me a piano, all of my confidence is gone. Same stage, same audience, same lights, same cameras. I have no confidence at all. Why? Because you've changed just a tiny piece of the context. And that's important to know because all confidence is contextual and it comes with risk. Uh, and those two things are skills. You can learn to calculate and mitigate risk and you can learn to develop yourself in any context. So confidence is a set of skills not a character trait so I, I like that that was number two and the third one is discipline right so discipline is the ability to choose your behavior in spite of how you feel and that i tell you that got me through my 20s okay? that's a big what? one that's huge it's absolutely massive this is the differentiator of among successful and unsuccessful entrepreneurs i swear to you this is the number one differentiator it's not network it's not finances it's discipline it's the ability to choose your own behavior and so for me, what that meant was like when I, in my twenties, when my friends were in the club, I was in the library. Okay. And, and when they were, when they were out partying, I was in bed sleeping because I had a, a pitch meeting the next day or, or something, you know, like I chose my behavior and yeah, it was hard. Um, but the ability to make a decision based on what you, what you've projected as a goal rather than what you feel in your body, man, that's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing skill. So I found that that's, those are three of the huge differentiators those are the first three pillars okay and number four i'm going to push you on this one and then i'm going to revisit some so okay. what's number what's number four number four is connecting your ability to make eye contact and connect with people meaningfully 
in a, in a very, in a very quick way. Like if you can connect meaningfully with people and add value to their lives very quickly, then you become for them the kind of person that's worthy of being followed. And that is the actual definition of a leader, right? A leader isn't defined by a set of character traits or a set of personality traits. And a leader definitely does not define themselves. A leader is defined by someone who follows them, right? I don't decide if I'm a leader or not. If somebody's following me, then I'm a leader. I don't get to choose whether they follow me or not. I get to choose whether or not I live a life worthy of being followed. And a really big part of that is the ability to connect with other people and diverse people, right? Having having input from people that are very different than you, different, different races, religions, gender, socioeconomic status, different geography, different languages. Like having that kind of diversity of input is a, is a huge asset uh to any to any leader so your ability to connect with people that are different than you that's your only hope of ever becoming omni talented okay so how does this link then with with step number two which is confidence <laughs> okay so the con confidence is your ability to build uh to assess your own ability as commensurate to the task so for example jeff i can't sing okay i wasn't born with that talent and even with 10,000 hours of Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, even with 10,000 hours, I might be able to be good enough to sing happy birthday at a birthday party and not get laughed at, but not by much, right? It's like, I'm never gonna be on stage at America's Got Talent. Uh, that's not confidence, that's arrogance. Okay, so confidence is really recognizing your ability as commensurate to the task. And if you think of your ability as higher than your ability actually is, that's arrogance. And But if you think of your ability as lower than your ability actually is, that's cowardice, right? So somewhere in between arrogance and cowardice, that's where that's where confidence actually lies, is your ability to decide that your, your abilities are commensurate to the task. And that can't possibly be true of every context, because we are not gods, right? We're not gods, we're not prophets, we're not omni-talented, we're not, um, nobody's omni-gifted, right? If you look at the strengths finder uh, from Gallup, they're pretty clear, like everybody's got different strengths. We all have a certain combination of them and we balance each other out. And I think the trick of amazing leadership then, what really, really adds confidence to leadership is to get rid of that, that arrogance that says, I'm the only one that's leading, I've got the answers, I know what to do, and bring it back down to, okay, I've got a limited view based on my education, my experience, and my character. But I can surround myself with people whose, uh, whose strengths are my weaknesses. And in that community, uh, then we can become omni-talented and we can make amazing quality decisions. So that's where, that's where connecting and confidence meet. Okay, okay, I get that. <laughs> we'll talk about rapport in a moment. Yeah, sure. A and and being brave enough to let's say meet your hero. Although they say mm -hmm. you should never meet the, your hero. So number <laughs> five then. Number five. <laughs> yeah, number five is rest. Okay, you are an an amazing machine, but you are not the kind of machine that can go forever, right? So. I've actually built an algorithm that helps uh, organizations to determine what the cost of a big night out is for an executive. So there's a number of studies on sleep and rest and how much sleep is necessary. By the way, for your viewers, uh, if you're a male, it's seven hours a night. If you're a female, it's seven hours and 20 minutes a night. As it turns out, beauty sleep is a thing and 20 <laughs> minutes is the actual amount <laughs> that's required. So statistically speaking, that's the average amount that's required by people. And so for some, it's a little more, for some, it's a little less, but that's the benchmark is seven hours for men, seven, seven hours and 20 minutes for women. Uh, but there's there's actually some really great studies on the impact of rest, right? Like your, your brain is just as active when you're sleeping as it is when you're awake, but you have 80% less information to digest right because your visual cortex is shut off so what do you what's it doing right if it's if it's just as busy but it's not taking in all of the world around it then what what's it busy doing well it's doing the dishes it's cleaning up you know messes on aisle four and it's flushing those beta amyloids out of your brain stem which is the only known cause of of alzheimer's and dementia right like we have to be able to sleep in order to clear that stuff out and to, to center our, our neurochemistry for the next day uh but uh, an employee who, let's say an executive, right? Say you have an executive, an executive who gets less than six hours a night of sleep for two consecutive nights, uh, their performance will drop by 12.1% and it'll be sustained over six days, even if they catch up on their sleep in night three. So we can actually calculate from that research, we know what the bottom line impact is to an organization if one of their CXOs has a big night out. 
So, right, we, we know, like if you take the weekend and you go on a binge, great, but you're gonna come back and this is how much it's gonna cost us as an organization on the bottom line, even if you catch up on Sunday night and even if you show up to work on time and sober Monday morning. There's still a cost, there's a performance deficit cost. So one of the things that I'm, I'm prescribing for my executive coaching clients and organizations is this, it's a sleep tracker, right? Like this this one, perhaps, yeah, this one's Whoop. I think there's a few other, there's Aura, there's a few different brands. I'm not promoting Whoop, I, they don't sponsor me. Uh, but this is my sleep tracker and it tells me every morning what my recovery rate is, how much time I spent in Delta sleep, how much time in REM, how many awake events I've had over the course of the night, even if I don't remember them. And yeah, sleep is incredibly important. So rest, uh, and that includes things like mindfulness, meditation, uh, taking time out during the day to just stop and uh, even an eight minute practice of mindfulness among executives boosts their performance level tremendously. And it staves off the, the, the decision making fatigue that usually sets in around the second half of the afternoon. And that increases decision making quality and, and input seeking behavior and that overall increases their performance. So yeah, strategic rest throughout the day and then making sure you're getting enough rest throughout the uh, the week in your sleep and then getting times of rest through the year, right? If you're taking a week off here and there in vacation to just reset, unplug, that's very, very important in terms of performance for both the executive and their organization. That's yeah, pillar I, five. I, yeah, I, I learned that one to my cost. In my oh, really? night, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not on the parties and nights out. I'm sure you upset a lot of people when you said, "Okay, no more nights <laughs> out. You need to go to bed and rest." <laughs> but, but for me, when I wrote my first book, which was the KPI book, mm -hmm. mentally, I wasn't ready to say, "Hey, Jeff, this is part of your job. You don't have to do it." Mm -hmm as well as your job. And I was right. burning the candle at both ends. My yeah. fitness was compromised. I certainly did not sleep at all. So and I did it for a year. So at the end wow. of it, at the end of it, I was really, really ill. I mean, okay. really ill, uh, severe memory loss, all mm -hmm. kinds of problems. So much so I had I was hospitalized through it. Wow. So, and the um, diagnosis at the end, stress. Yeah, of course. And, and, yeah, yeah of course. and they said, okay, I wonder what caused that then. <laughs> so I said, well, I've just been writing a book. I'd be working and then I'd get up at yeah. 2 a.m., work until 6 a.m., then the family wow. would wake up, then it's the normal day, then I go to bed at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., wake up at 2 p.m., write until 6 a.m., and so the cycle continued. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's but really tough. It was it was insane. <laughs> it yeah, was insane. Well, it's no wonder you broke down, man. You can't yeah. run a machine that hard for that long. Like, yeah, we're for sure. We were incredible machines, right? Don't get me wrong. You are the product of 10,000 successful generations of survival and adaptation, okay? That's an amazing machine. But we live in an era of abundance now, and there is just so many good things to do. And we, we're running our own heads crazy trying to do all the good things. Yeah. All at once. You know, yeah. it, just, it can't be done sometimes. Okay. So uh, number six then, please. Yeah. Pillar number six is competition. Remember, you are also 10,000 generations of successful survival and adaptation. And a lot of that was competitive. Okay. So we have this intrinsic internal drive to compete. We compare ourselves to people all the time. My car is better than theirs. My TV is not as big as hers. Right, like these, we're, I want that job. I want his life. I want all. We're we're trained mentally to compare ourselves. So if we use that to our advantage, because we're going to do it anyway, and we curate mental competition for ourselves that actually sets a benchmark that's high enough that we don't compete directly with them for the sake of beating them, but competing directly with them helps us to develop ourselves. We get way stronger. So I use a, I use an illustration in the book, actually, my uh, one of the guys at my CrossFit class, his name was Toby, and he was always in a different class than me, but we had the whiteboard so we could show our, our marks for the day and our times and our lifts and everything, right? So at the end of the workout, you put up your mark. At the end of the day, I'd look at it and I'd say, oh man, Toby, man, he's, to he's always just a little bit ahead of me and I'm, I'm heading for this guy, I'm like trying to, turns out he was 12 years younger than me, right? I didn't know that until we were celebrating his birthday. There was no way I was going to ever beat this kid, but fighting for it helped me to develop, right? So my, my development 
went up, went skyrocketing because I had this competitive benchmark that I was never ever going to hit, and I was actually aiming for it. And this is, I think, one of the things that drives really great competitors like Microsoft and Apple or uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, for example. Those two guys, they they meet each other on the pitch maybe twice a year, okay? But they've been passing the Ballon d'Or back and forth for more than a decade. And I don't see why they couldn't be friends. I think Cristiano Ronaldo said that in an interview once. It's like, yeah, we could probably have dinner together. I don't see why not. And actually, he said, he said, the, the fact that Lionel Messi is on the planet makes me a better footballer. Right, so he gets it, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. If you find people in your industry, maybe not in your direct company because you don't want to be tearing away from your own your own sources of income, but if you find somebody in your industry that's at a level a little bit higher than you, and you aim for them and you compete with them directly in your head, uh, use your comp use your competitive advantages for your own self development. You'll get a lot stronger. Yeah, definitely. I also say, train harder than you have to fight in real life. Yeah, good. I like that. Yeah. yeah so exactly. let's go back to number one, then, if I may. Fitness. Sure. Now, yeah. Curry, never in a million years <laughs> am I going to run a marathon. <laughs> Why? Why not? And I, do, I, do, I, right, I don't see playing golf on a, on a <laughs> golf buggy as fitness yeah. either. So yeah, yeah. when we're talking about fitness for leadership, what kind of fitness are we talking about and how can we measure it? Mm. How can we assess ourselves? Yeah, look, I am not a fitness coach. I am not a fitness trainer. And so I'm going to, I'm going to back off from giving you blind advice on this. Sure. My, uh, my rule of thumb is you should, you should spike your heart rate to whatever a hundred percent is once a week, right? That teaches your heart to pump at its hardest and just lets it know that there are times in your life when you're going to have to pump at your hardest. So whether you're cycling or sprinting or lifting things, spike your heart rate, right? Once a week. Uh, and then at least three to four times a week, some kind of cardio to, to make sure the, the blood is pumping properly, that all the nutrients are moving around well, that all the muscles can move well. And I also recommend some kind of uh, like Pilates or stretching or yoga uh, to keep your mobility because we, we lose our mobility over time as well. So a little just basic fitness. But honestly, if you're at that executive level, you aspire to get at that executive level, there's no excuse for you to not have a fitness coach. You really should be doing that because you are an embodied soul. You're not disembodied. You're stuck there in that machine and you want that machine to be working for you, not against you when you need it the most. Okay. Step two is confidence. What I like about what you said there, it's not a thing that can be measured. It's a skill. Now the mm. thing about skills, a skill can be learned. Yes. yes. So there'll be somebody listening right now who has a lack of confidence of and they can't, and they can't believe what are we talking about? <laughs> so how can we help them? And okay. what, can, what can they do? Yeah, perfect. Just think of the context in which you want to gain confidence. Like, for example, if I was to, if I can lift 100 kilograms, okay, that's interesting, right? Now, if 100 kilograms is the maximum I can lift, and I want to try and lift more than my maximum, I'm going to have to take a risk, right? Because anything more than my maximum, I've never done before. By definition, I've never done it. And therefore, by definition, it's a risk. So am I going to lift 150 kilograms? 120? There's actually a magical scientific figure that helps us to determine what kinds of risks we should take that will help us to build confidence and help us to succeed more often than we fail. And the number is four, four percent. I should actually lift 104 kilograms. Uh, subjectively speaking, if you're talking about public speaking on stage or asking that guy out that you really think is hot in the bar, whatever your whatever your confidence thing is, Think of something that's 4% more difficult than anything you've ever done before in that context. That's the thing you should try because 4% gain is you've got a pretty good chance of actually achieving it um, and you'll gain confidence as a result. If you try 1% harder, you're not going to gain any confidence because it's too close to the, to the line of what you've already done. But if you try something 4% har harder and you know it's 4% harder, even if it's a subjective idea in your mind, you will gain the confidence that's associated with that risk. Okay, so we're talking about changing our lives now. We're moving on to step three, discipline. Yeah. Okay, so here's a quote that I like. Go Motivation on. gets you going. Discipline or determination keeps you yeah. going. 
Yeah. So what's the difference between the two and how can we then, uh, what tips do you have to say, okay, you need to be disciplined. Yeah, sure. How do we actually do that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so motivation is a weak force in the human brain. Uh, it's called dopamine and dopamine burns out pretty quickly in the brain. But when, just if you're sitting on the couch and you think, oh man, I really, I really should go to the gym or I should write that report or I should practice my violin, whatever it is you're instantly motivated to do, that initial motivation is a hit of dopamine in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex right here, okay, next to the reward and achievement center. And it lasts about 30 seconds. That's it. If you just sit on the couch and wait for 30 seconds, that dopamine hit will burn out. And then your brain gives you a second hit of dopamine to reward you for not doing anything. But it gives you that hit back here in the anterior insula next to the uh, risk avoidance center of your brain. So it says, it's like Corey, I think Corey's thinking he's got to go to the gym. So I think, yeah, I got to go to the gym. Wow, that's awesome, right? So I get a hit of dopamine to reward me for thinking about that. But if I just sit there for 30 seconds, that dopamine hit will burn off. And then my brain, because it's smarter than me, back here, it's smarter than me. It's a million years old, right? So it's going, ah, oh, Corey didn't go to the gym, right? Okay, well, he must be avoiding a risk. Right? There's a warring tribe we can't see. The weather is bad. He might get laughed at and excluded from his, his community. So yeah, good job. Good job, Corey, for not going to the gym. Good job for avoiding the risk associated with getting whatever done you wanted to get done. So our brains are actually hardwired to reward us for procrastinating. If we procrastinate, we can become literally chemically heroin level addicted to not doing things. And that's the key. You have to recognize that when you have that initial motivation, you've got 30 seconds, you have to stand up and you have to move in that direction. You don't have to get everything done, but you do have to start so that your brain rewards you for showing up and not for avoiding risk. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Connecting. Yeah. So what, what's fascinating here, if you listen to, I, I mean, I think this is show number 55 to 60, something like that. And there will obviously 55, 60 different people. But yeah. the, the way I interact and I speak with people, people always comment on it and say, oh, you're so different on each of these shows with different people. And I say, right. yeah, of course I am. And they say, yeah. why? <laughs> So I'm going to let you handle it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about, <laughs> this is about <laughs> connecting, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so we have never met. Never. That's we've, correct. We, we've not, been. Not directly. No. Uh, uh, even, no. Well, even now, no. But even, <laughs> even before we showed up today and connected on this program, we have never spoken. We've never met. We've just exchanged yeah. a couple of emails. That's right. And then, then we meet <laughs> and it's like, we're all buddies. They've been friends for 50 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah that's right. What, what can, what can people do to enhance their skills of connection? Yeah, look, eye contact is big, obviously, and it's difficult for it's difficult for you to make eye contact with me and for me to make eye contact with you, because if I was to make eye contact with you, I would be looking down here on my screen and I would have the idea that we're making eye contact, but you wouldn't because you're still up here. So in order for me to make eye contact with you digitally, I've got to be looking at a camera and I have to emote to you based on your voice, not on your face. So that's a little bit difficult in the digital world. Uh, but eye contact is very powerful. And then I would I would honestly recommend just follow Gary Chapman's five love languages. Uh, people like uh, a little bit of a little bit of friendly touch to let you know that they're uh, to let let them know that you're not a threat. Uh, they like gifts, acts of service. They like uh, words of affirmation. Those those love languages really matter in the real world. And if you can figure out what somebody's love language is pretty quickly, then you know how to connect with them also very quickly. And it's not it's not a difficult skill to learn. Just remember, you need to communicate value to somebody in a language that might not be your own. So you might, you know, love words of affirmation, but somebody else might really be about uh, quality time, for example, and you might you might misunderstand each other if you're trying to add value. Uh, the second thing is recognize that you are a million year old social animal. OK, none of us gets out of this planet alive and none of us gets through a single day alone you're going to interact with at least a thousand different lives between the time you're, you wake up and the time that you go to bed, uh, including the people that made your 
clothes, the people that put gas in your car, the people that design your car. Like there's a thousand different lives that go into you getting through even one of your days. We are social creatures and our survival is dependent on us figuring out who it is on the planet that will provide for us and protect us when we're not looking. So you are wired for this. Okay. You are wired to connect. And that, that doesn't mean everybody's extroverted and that doesn't mean everybody is, is outgoing. I'm, I'm an outgoing introvert, by the way. Uh, I recharge. <laughs> yeah, go figure. I, yeah, I recharge same here. When I'm by myself. I, I love to be alone. I'm, I, I love to read. I love to write. And I spend hours every day alone. When I'm in a crowd, I'm very outgoing. So people would tag me as an extrovert. But no, my, when I'm in a crowd, my battery is going down. Right. And at some point in the evening, usually my battery will just run out. And then I'll be like, yeah, honey, it's time to go. And I'll be done. Just like battery is over. Um, but yeah, when you're when you're connecting, just remember that you're you're here to add value to other people's lives and they're here to add value to your life. And that mutual exchange of value can happen in any context. And most of it, it begins, honestly, with with eye contact. We've got a million years of evolutionary psychological history doing this. See, I can make eye contact with all of you all at the same time. Think about it. There might be a thousand people watching this podcast and I can make eye contact with you all at once. I can't do that in an auditorium. I can only make eye contact with one person at a time. And so I move across the audience like that, but technology is amazing. And so here we are. Yeah, I think eye contact is <laughs> mind blowing. And I'll tell you right? why. I'll tell you why. It's because I've seen a dead person with their eyes open. And it's not the same as looking at a person who is alive with their That's eyes true. open. What's the difference? I don't know. But they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. But mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And and I just want to repeat one thing you said there about the virtual world where people yeah. look at the screen and not the camera. Yes. It, <laughs> that doesn't connect. It disconnects. I Espe agree. Yeah. yeah, it disconnects. And I mean, especially where you are on my screen. I mean, I'm looking at my camera now, of course, <laughs> not at you. So right. the, the peripheral <laughs> vision is taking and brain is working all the magic. But yeah. if if you were to look at me on your screen, then you're looking down yeah. into my lap and I'm thinking, what's he doing? <laughs> it, exactly. it, just, it just doesn't work. No, it just exactly. doesn't work. So yeah. eye contact <laughs> is the big one there. Okay, we've spoken enough, I think, about step five, which is rest. Sure. We need rest. No parties. We need rest. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, competition absolutely yeah. makes sense of us as Brilliant as beings. Okay, I'll come on to your second book in a little while. <laughs> sure. So, Corey, you've had four lifetimes. Yeah, at least. Not at all least. of I them have had a really, been. really good run so far. And I think I'm, over, I'm not even halfway. Yeah. My life expectancy has gone up by 15 years since I was born. So am I supposed to, I'm expecting now I should be living to 130, maybe 140, given the, the trajectory of new technology and the fact that artificial intelligence is solving all of our uh, our issues now, like, yeah, I, I don't think there's an upper limit on how long I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. What am Would I going to do with all that extra time, Jeff? Yeah, write more books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get, exactly. Get fitter, build your confidence, <laughs> increase your discipline, uh, work on connecting, and of course, rest more and be more competitive. Yeah. That's what you're going to yes, do right. with all this extra time you're going to have. Exactly, exactly. So you've had four very different lifetimes yeah, so yeah. far. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Not all of them have been good. Well, look, there've been challenges in all of them, but that's what makes a great adventure, right? All of the sure. great adventures, all of the great stories you've ever read, um, the protagonist has incredible challenges. And I and I, I don't escape that pattern, right? Like I've been bankrupt a couple of times. I've been divorced, obviously. I've uh, I've raised my kids during a year in, a, in the middle of a civil war. Um, yeah, it's been, some of the stuff have been really tough. I've buried, two of my companies. So I started uh, seven successful, seven companies, but I've buried two and, and I've exited five successfully. And yeah, it's some of those days were really, really bad, right? Which, which day would you like to hear about? Like, I'll tell you about all of it. Like, I don't mind. Okay. Spend I... The rest of the podcast talking about all my failures and all of the hard days. Okay. So 
and people are listening and go and, and thinking, he's this really successful guy. He's on TV. Yeah. He's worked for the United yeah. Nations. He's written a couple yeah. of books. <laughs> he, he's done all kinds of stuff. Cory Block is my hero. What did he just say? He's been bankrupt twice. What? Yes, twice. How can um. that be? <laughs> so let let let's put reality into perspective mm. here because as we know failure is a, is an inherent part of success correct so i don't need to know about all of the bad news but i think right. we ought to talk about one of the bankruptcies what business were you in sure. and what caused it uh well the first one was actually the 2008 crisis so my ex-wife and i we had our uh, savings invested with a broker and the broker went bankrupt and there was no recourse so we just watched over the course of three weeks where everything that we had built up just went away um, that was very hard I but I found the bottom of a bottle of whiskey and I got back to work because that's what you do I guess right like there's no choice I'm an apex predator and I hunt so I'm just going to go hunting and you know what Jeff I found out through that first of all bankruptcy is not fatal right you can survive it uh, and secondly, there's an unlimited amount of money in the world, right? We're printing more all the time. I'll just go yeah. get more, right? So that um, was my first. That was my now first it's lesson. actually now it's virtual. We don't yeah. have to print money anymore. We <laughs> just true. add. We just add a digit, and that's it's what. True. And that's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, inflation just adds more digits to the in, to the fake money that we've made. Plus, if we're not happy with the money that we've that the currencies that we've created, we just create more currencies, right? Like there's a whole crypto space full of currencies that we've just created that hold value based on people's agreement that it holds value. It's like goodwill, right? But we're trading in non-asset backed goodwill. It's, a, it's an incredible innovation. Anyway, so enough about that. That was my first one, 2008. My second one was 2015. Um, I had started a strategy firm with a partner of mine and it uh, we in 18 months, we had a number of employees we were doing really well, great businesses, great clients. It was incredible. And then uh, just in one day, based on a bad deal that had absolutely nothing to do with me or my company, our trade license was revoked and everything went down just like that. I was devastated because I had to tell all of those people they were they're out of work and I was out of work and I had put all of my my savings into this. And so I had to go back to my my wife again and say, look, everything we have is gone. And I'm just going to be over here. I'm going to find the bottom of this particular bottle and then I'm going to get back to work. <laughs> but you're going to have to give me until Thursday. Right. Yeah. That's, so there's yeah, again, look, it's not fatal. Right. And there's an unlimited amount of money out there. Um, but the third thing I, I, I learned was post-traumatic growth. Right. Like when you, when you don't get stronger when you're when you're in the gym okay you don't get stronger when you're in the gym that's a misnomer you don't get stronger when you're lifting weights when you're lifting the weights that's what breaks your muscle down it uses the calories in your body it breaks the, the glycogen down and uses that right that's not when you get stronger you get stronger when you're sleeping that's when the repair job is being done okay so i don't get stronger when i'm being bankrupt but going through that makes me stronger when I'm recovering. So I'm, when I'm in the recovery phase and I'm like, okay, what can I learn from this? That's where post-traumatic growth comes in. And post-traumatic growth is a step above resilience. And I know that resilience is such a huge topic in business these days. There's a lot of training that's based on resilience. And, and I, don't, I don't wanna take anything away from that, but resilience is the ability to maintain the status quo in spite of heavy opposition. I get that, that's a huge strength, okay? But what if we could become stronger through the trauma of whatever happens to us in our organizations? What if we could become better as a result of that? What if the trauma wasn't traumatic, but uh, wasn't, was, didn't result in post-traumatic stress, but resulted in post-traumatic growth? And that's a huge area of positive psychology is this ability to take from really hard experiences something that strengthens us. And when we're in that recovery phase and we're dealing with the, the autopsy of our experience, uh, to, to take out those learnings and say, yeah, you know what, now I'm, I'm better, I'm stronger. And as a result of my my second experience, one of my one of my most important decisions actually it came from my uh, my ex wife. She said she said looked at me and she said, "Well, you're you're never gonna you're never gonna do that again." I said, "What?" And she says, "Trust people like that." And I said, "Actually, you know what? I think I will." And she she was staring at me and she was like, "And I said, no, 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 I, I'm not willing to become hard like this. I I trusted somebody. We made a really 
good but risky business decision. It was challenging. We lost the bet. Um, but you know what? I'm I'm going to trust people again because that's who I am, and I'm not willing to let this change who I am in my character. Uh, I'm not going to become resilient to this. I'm going to grow, and uh, and that has become one of the hallmarks of my business. Actually, is that I I do trust based trust based business, and I've just become stronger at doing what hurt me rather than rather than shy away from it. I love the difference between the two there. As you rightly say, resilience is kind of a hot topic. And yeah. uh, lots of people talk yeah. about resilience. Now, what's interesting, I've done a few podcasts with people who call it resilience. Yeah. But what they've actually done is what you've just described as post-traumatic growth. Yes. So the, the different catastrophe and make yeah. it better. The difference between the two is really, really significant. And yeah, yeah I like that. Good. Okay. <laughs> so you've been bankrupt twice. You survived. Yeah. You had a few bottles of whiskey that late <laughs> night. I hope you took plenty of rest before I you did. came back yes. in. Yes. 100%. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So your second book. I like the title of this yeah. one. Business is personal. Business yeah. is personal. Business is personal. So this is a blueprint for finding meaning at work. So yes. same three <laughs> questions, my friend. Why Got did it. why did you write it? Who is it for? And what will they get from it? I again I wrote it because I was frustrated. Um, it's written for absolutely so one because you're irritated and the second one because you're frustrated. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So basically I just take like what really irritates yeah. me about the world and I turn it into, into a book. Into a book Actually, yeah. that's, that's true. My, my next two books are exactly the same. I've taken something that really irritates me and I've tried to solve the problem and, and I've done that. And so my next two books are coming out one at the end of this year, one at the beginning of next year. I'll tell you about those later, but anyway. So uh, business is personal came out of this frustration as a, as a, you know, as an entrepreneur in my early twenties, I would be trying to make deals and network with people and broker with people. And they'd say, oh, you know, uh, we're not going to go with you this time. We're going to go with this other service provider, but don't worry. It's, it's not personal. It's just business. And I heard that a lot in my twenties and it turned yeah. out like it occurred to me that that's not true. <laughs> That's not true. It's never been true. It'll never be true. Every business decision that every organization makes takes resources from one economic tribe and moves it to another economic tribe, right? And it doesn't matter how big the tribe is, those tribes that gain more resources get to feed their families better, right? And they, and that's at the end of the day, what we're all doing here. We're not here because we're deeply in love with tires or acrylic sheets or socks or whatever our company is, right? We're not deeply connected with the hamburgers we're spitting out every day. What we're deeply connected with is our reasons for being here, right? And our reasons are usually we've got family, we've got kids we want to educate, we want a good quality of life for ourselves, we want to retire at a decent age, take a vacation, eat decent food, drive a nice car, you know, whatever it is, our goals have nothing to do with the particular products and services of the organizations that we are dedicating half of our lives to every single day. And that turned out to me to be an incredible dichotomy to recognize, like, how is it that such an intelligent species as humans would dedicate half of our waking lives every single day to an economic project that we don't care about? Well, it's because dedicating our time and our efforts and our talents and skills to those economic projects helps us to achieve other goals. And as it turns out, humans don't really need to care about the what of our jobs, right? We can be an accountant and not care about spreadsheets. I have never met an accountant that wakes up in the morning going, oh man, I'm so excited to balance another spreadsheet today. Like they don't, it just doesn't happen, right? So, but they're dedicating half of their lives to that every day. And the meaning they find in that isn't in the spreadsheet itself, but in the relationships they have with the people in their economic communities, which is their businesses. Uh, and then their reasons for being there, which usually have something to do with their family and their quality of life. So that's, that's where, I started to think deeply about the meaning of work. What is meaningful about work? And then how is it that we can reconnect with the, the truth that has always been there behind all of our organizations, that all business has a personal impact on some life somewhere. Okay. I, lo I love the twists. I love the twists. It's not personal. It's just business. Yeah. So the, the book is called 
Business is personal. Uh, yeah. Yes. I hadn't picked up on that. I, I actually do like it. So who is it for? And what will yeah. the reader get from it? It's for any employee in any organization. And what you're going to get for it, from it is a blueprint for finding meaning in the work that you're already doing. So there's a lot of employees out there. I mean, I'll give you an example. Like I, I use it in the book and I only use it there because it actually happens to me probably once or twice a month is I'll meet somebody for the very first time. And my habit is to say, okay, you know, what's your name? They'll say, Jim. Hi, Jim. Great to meet you. What do you do? Oh, well, I'm, you know, a logistics uh, a logistics coordinator in my in my company and I say oh that's great so I usually ask them you know are you good at it and do you enjoy it right do you because you're dedicating half of your life to this Jim uh, your logistics operator so do you enjoy it and are you good at it? well I'm good at it yeah but I don't you know it's a job it's a job it pays the bills I show up they give me my check I go home and I think that's really sad and really common it's a really sad really common story because I think you know what I, I don't know how many days I get in my life uh, Jeff, I just know that once the days are gone, they're never ever coming back and they're limited, right? So absolutely, I, I want them to be as meaningful as possible. And if Jim, the logistics coordinator, is not finding meaning in the half of his life that he's dedicating to that work every single day, well, there's something wrong. There's something missing. And I think I can help. And that's what the book is, is my, my attempt to help people to find meaning in the work that they're already in. And usually that takes the course of not, not finding meaning in the what of their, right? So I'm not tackling the logistics coordination part of the job. What I'm tackling is the relationships that Jim builds with the people that are around him, the relationship he has with his direct line manager, with that, which has a significant impact on his sense of job satisfaction and career development. Uh, and then his reasons for being there, which is his kids his wife, he wants to increase the quality of their lives. He wants to have better education option for his kids than he had growing up. He wants to drive a decent car and take a vacation once a year. You know, that's where he's actually there. And if he can connect well with who, and you can connect well with why, then the what really doesn't matter at all. Uh, and that's what the book really is about. So it's, it's helping employees to figure out their particular why for being there and their particular who for, uh, for being in that particular organization at that time. Okay, so we've mentioned meaning. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I get it. So we've mentioned two of your books now: Spartan yeah. CEO and Business is Personal. Yeah. How do we buy <laughs> them? Where do we get them from? Oh, anywhere: Barnes and Noble, Amazon, wherever you want. Just find, you can search them on any book online store, and they will ship it to you. Okay, it's not complicated to find them. You can find there's they're in Kindle. They're I don't know if they're in hardback anymore, but they are definitely in softback. And soft cover and yeah you can um go ahead and just search them anywhere on amazon i can give you the links if you like okay uh, but don't worry about don't worry about supporting me i don't need money from the books right i'm doing okay as an executive coach i want the books to help you uh, and if the books don't help you or they're not doing enough for you please just reach out to me directly i will do my best linkedin is my my venue of choice okay so let's deal with that one now then if someone wants to yes. reach out to you corey and um extend this chat how do they do that how do we reach you yep so on my website coreyblock.com uh it's very easy to find there's a contact form if you send that it'll go to my marketing team my marketing team will flag me and they'll say hey you got a personal message so just let, uh, remind me when you, whenever you reach out to me, uh, reach out to me either on that website or on uh, LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. I'm very easy, easily searchable there. Send me a direct message uh, on either of those two venues and say, Hey, I saw Dr. Corey on Jeff Smith's uh, podcast, and I really want to connect on a couple of the ideas or concepts and they will flag it to me. I will respond to you directly. Okay. That's my commitment to you. Cool. And you're also very easy to find on LinkedIn also. Yes. Okay. Going back to this second book of yours, Business is Personal, Finding yeah. Meaning at Work. Yeah. During your mm -hmm. research and the writing of this, did you tackle this everlasting question of what is my purpose? Oh, 100%. That's yeah, I thought, I, I thought you might. Yes. So. Yeah. But people want to know why they're here, right? Why do I exist? Yeah. Why, why am I on the planet? And the good news is, the good news is, Jeff, you get to decide. <laughs> you get right? to like, decide what your purpose <laughs> is. Yes, yes, absolutely. Like you're born with a certain set of talents and skills and 
to some things that you're good at and some things that you're not good at. But from, from that basket of experiences and talent and, and genetics, from that basket, you have a lot of raw materials to play with. And we live in the most abundant time in all of human history, Jeff. This is the best time to be alive. We have more communications and technology and transportation and career options and healthcare possibilities than have ever existed on this planet before. And we who are alive today, we're not responsible for them. We didn't create them. Right? So we're living in this incredible era of abundance and we get to decide how we add value back to that world. So I think work, work is, it's, it's fundamentally an act of gratitude, right? We're, we're here to, we, we work in order to express gratitude for being born into an abundant world that we ourselves did not create. Okay. And it's an exchange of value. It's our way of adding value to the world in exchange for a share of the resources so that we can do the things that we want to do. And the resources we usually get is money, and that's a proxy for other things, like a good lifestyle and dinner out with your wife and things like that, right? So it's a proxy. Uh, but yeah, like that, that meaning at work really comes from those two things is gratitude and, and the value exchange. And I, I, think, I think that is, a, you know, honestly, it's a tremendous eye-opener because it means that you can take the best of what you have and you can create value in any way that you want. Okay. And so you get to decide what your purpose is. Right. On that very note, I want to dig a little bit deeper, Corey. And this is because yeah. very, very often I'll get a message from a listener and say, that was a great show, Jeff. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. I particularly enjoyed the question on what is my purpose? Because yeah. I'm still searching. So Jeff, help me. How do I find my purpose? So yeah. that's a question that comes up all of the time. And here's Dr. Cory Block saying, yeah. well, you decide. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, <laughs> I haven't had that answer before. So lots of guests have explained about how they found their purpose. Yeah. I have explained a little bit about purpose too. So this mm -hmm. is a new direction. So, Someone listening now is scratching their head and they're thinking, okay, I want to find my purpose yeah. and I'm struggling. How do I do it? Yeah. Question one. Question two is what you've brought up. Say, well, actually, you don't have to go in search of it. You can decide. Yeah. So let's, mar let's marry these two together. And perhaps the way we can attack this is... Do we have to have a purpose is the first one. Now it's starting to get really deep, right? I love this. <laughs> we're going to go, we're going to go, yeah, we're going to go yeah, full yeah. on philosophy right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm coming back to Dubai. So oh, good. I'll, I'll come and find you. We'll find that bottle of whiskey. hundred percent, hundred percent. We're going to do, we're going to do four hours of philosophy in my back. Yeah. It's going to be beautiful. I, Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I'll, and we'll be in with the first question. What is the meaning of life? And let's right. see, let's see where it goes Easiest from there. Ever. Yeah. Okay. But so I do okay. have an answer Pur for this. Purpose. Okay. Right. Purpose. Okay. So most people think that of purpose as something that needs to be discovered. Uh, because most people have an extrinsic lo locus of control. They're always reacting to the world around them and they don't feel like they have any control of the world around them. Well, in fact, you actually do. And this is the, the fun foundations behind things like the secret and affirmations and intentions and putting that out there. And, and so I think that your purpose is something that you design and the raw materials are things you're good at, things you enjoy, and things that people will pay you to do. Because remember, you're a social being and you're behind, you're participating in a, in a social environment and you have to do something that adds enough value that people will agree with you and say, hey, that, that adds value. And so here's a share of the resources. If you want the hunters to share the meat with you, you have to provide some sort of service, right? Education or, or agriculture, even in the very earliest of, of human development, we, we trade services for a share of the value. So now you get the good news is that nobody decides for you, you decide, okay? So you have all of these raw materials to work with, things you're good at, things you enjoy and things people will pay you to do. Now, what do you want? You can pick, okay? Then you get to decide what your purpose is based on those things. You don't have to discover it from some far off thing. It's not like 
the universe or God is, has decided exactly what your purpose should be. And your job is then to discover it. I, I love Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. I get it. Like it was brilliant and it sold like 50 million copies or something. We should pay attention to that. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of universal wisdom. But I think what he got wrong was that we are co-creators in that purpose, that whatever God or the universe has prepared for us is also ours to create with. We are creative beings. And that is something that goes not just into the, the, the skyscrapers that we build in our cities or the artwork we put on our walls, but our lives ourselves. We are co-creators of our own lives. And so our purpose isn't something that's only to be discovered, but something that also is to be designed. We get to choose. And that is incredibly powerful awakening for people. I half agree with you. Half. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we just love a bit of controversy, huh? Yeah, come on. Okay, so your Venn diagram. Yeah. So we have something you're good at, something yeah. you love, and something you get paid for. Yeah. Okay, pick any two of these then. So we can be paid for something, and we can be good at it, but we might not love it. So in that, in, in that situation, we're talking one of your book topics here, in that... You can you can be good at it you get paid handsomely yeah but this is where you become unfulfilled there must be something more to life mm. okay now let's pick another two let's say you get paid for it you love yeah. what you do and yeah. i know people like this but you're not very good at it yes <laughs> right it's okay true. it's true so so that happens and that well you probably have a few career adjustments in your life mm. if, if you're yes. falling into this category then we've got the other one where you're good at something yeah you love what you do yeah but you don't no get paid don't for pay. it <laughs> no, no, no equally this could also be your purpose because I do a lot of work for charities that I don't get mm. paid for. I'm very right. good at it. I love what I do, but there's there's no money in it. And there are people with very low paid jobs who fall into this category. In some right. cases, it might be unsustainable, but it mm. could also be Curry, that they have found their purpose and they're loving what they do. It's mm. part of who they are. The utopia is, of course, all three. Yes. And if you can find a career, a business that provides you with the money for what mm -hmm. you love and what you're good at, then that's you and I. That, that's, that's right. That, that's awesome. <clears throat> However, let me put another spin on this. <laughs> I was not blessed with academia where you are. <laughs> So, and um, I can't sing, so we have that in common as well. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, so my blessing is, <coughs> excuse me, my blessing was understanding how business works. I don't good. know how I do it. I can just look at it and I see it. I hear it. I feel it. It's multi-sensory what's going on. Yeah. And I've de designed lots of concepts with key performance indicators. Right. I don't have to think about it. They just appear. I'm, I'm just blessed. Okay, good so I've got something I'm good at. I love it. I'm passionate. Mm -hmm. yeah. I get paid for it, which is yeah. awesome. Now here's the spin. I wrote a book. This is the book, and I don't like writing. This is right. the book I wrote in year 2000, and at the end of it, I was trashed, yeah. but this, this book has made a difference to the world. And I think mm. that's part of my purpose. Sure. But yeah, of course. Thing. Yeah. But yeah. I, do, I don't like it. Ah, it, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, I can help. Yeah. Can yeah. Help. Okay. R writing is not my thing. I'll okay. do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll do it. And I've written seven books. So I, yeah, I can yeah, get yeah. I can get past it. I know how to write bestsellers. It's formulaic. I know yeah. how to do it. And I, I I've, I'm writing another four at the moment. So right. Doing it right. is okay. 
my yeah. points my points about the purpose is somebody might be looking for utopia thinking mm, yes this is what i love this is what i was born to do mm -hmm. now i was born to write that particular book i think yes yeah it's your magnum opus yeah. and everything falls from that after that yeah got yeah it. yeah but I wouldn't, I, I, I mean, yes, I chose to do it. Otherwise I wouldn't have done it, of course, yeah. but it's the journey wasn't pleasant. And it, sure. I, I didn't think, oh yeah, let's get up at 2 a.m. and write this book. How lucky am I? So, right. so he, he, here's what I'm putting forward now. We, we're talking about yeah. purpose. Purpose right. need not be, need not complete the Venn diagram. It, as in, you need not have all three. That's right. Uh, for it, for it to be a purpose, and you might discover your purpose, and it might be something you don't like, or okay, not good so at. Here's, yeah. Right. Okay. I do have something that's going to help you in this. Uh, you're confusing purpose with happiness. Uh, things. Your purpose isn't meant to make you happy. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to burst everybody's bubble on that. Purpose and happiness are totally different concepts. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Case in point, my whole life, all of my four lifetimes, whatever, anything that I've done that's been really, really worthwhile in my life has not made me happy. I guarantee you. Starting businesses, raising kids, um, writing books, doing PhDs, like I was, I'm exactly like you, two in the morning, nobody is standing behind me saying, go Corey, go, right? There's no cheering section. And I'm sitting there and I'll tell you with all of those things, anything that's really worthwhile, even the long-term committed relationships I've been in, you can't have the long-term committed relationship without the long-term and the committed. And all of those things fall into that sort of balance of about 85% really hard work and 15% joy, right? You'll have joy at the time. Oh, I got that chapter completed, or I found a new idea and I'm, I'm happy about that. Or my kid finally cleaned his room. Like that's, you'll have joy. 15% of the time, but if you want to do something that's fulfilling in your life, it's going to be 85% really hard work. And that is your purpose too. Don't conflate purpose with happiness. It's not going to make you happy. Okay. If you want to be happy, eat a Big Mac, watch Netflix, because that's going to make you happy, right? You'll get the dopamine and the serotonin and it'll, it's all going to be great up here. Okay. But if you want to be fulfilled, you're going to have to get to work and there's going to be really, really hard days. Uh, and that's the difference between happiness and fulfillment. And I think purpose falls on the side of fulfillment and not happiness. And I think happiness is distracting people from finding their purpose. I totally agree. I would even say, let's use your metaphor. You don't get strong in the gym. Yeah. You rip your muscles in the gym. You That's get right. strong afterwards. Working on your purpose is like tearing your muscles in the gym. The yes. fulfillment and the happiness doesn't come until afterwards. Yeah. And I, and yeah, I think, it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's tough. This is where your determination and discipline, your step <laughs> number three in your book absolutely yes. comes in, you know, because <laughs> yeah. mot motivation, that 30 second hit. Oh yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Now it's keeping going and, and. I think a lot to do with purpose and why people succeed and others don't. Mm. We're on the same subject here is yeah. having a good enough reason why. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I, I like what Simon Sinek says about why. I like what Peter Drucker says about purpose. Um, I call it vision. It doesn't matter. Those are all just semantics. It's a bunch of consultants saying different words meaning the same thing. But basically, if you have an idea of what your life should look like if everything goes well and it never always goes well right that's the caveat there's never going to be no bumps in the road but if you have an idea of what your life could look like if everything goes pretty well and you just stay on that idea and head toward it and then you're able to like move around the obstacles and move with the current and recover and then strong and you know and fight the challenges and overcome things along the way toward that vision that's that's purpose you may not actually achieve the vision but your purpose is the aspiration and the behaviors of pursuing that vision in spite of whatever obstacles and challenges might come your way. So having the vision is important, uh, but your purpose isn't the achievement of the vision, it's the pursuit. Yeah, absolutely. So purpose is the hard work. 
get yes. it down the enjoyment comes afterwards yep. during the rest yeah. period okay wonderful i love that totally agree with <laughs> all of that okay we've spoken about two books you hinted kind of saying yeah. ask me later jeff i'm writing another two books so what yes. are they yeah. and what why two Ah, uh, because they're very different books and they both answer challenges that my executive coaching clients are, are facing at the moment. Um, one of them is, is empathy in leadership. And so I've actually taken, uh, it's kind of controversial. I was talking about it with Stephen Covey over lunch in um, December in Dubai. And he says, look, Corey, you, you have to write the book. That has to be, it has to be written. So I think I'm going to ask him to write the forward for it. But the book is, is uh, playfully titled Love at Work, um, the, the Final Frontier in Empathetic Leadership. And what I want to tackle is the concept that we have, the concepts that surround the word love at work and what love means in a leader follower relationship in an organizational setting because we've all had we have those memories right when we work for a leader and we say oh man i really love that guy right and it's something it's a quip we just say it we don't actually mean i love you we say i love that guy or if somebody in the office does something for us you say oh i love you that's awesome okay but so you say it as a quip but actually we do have in our memories most of us memories of relationships, follower leader relationships, where we would say, yeah, you know what, that person's character really moved me. They were influential for me and I would follow them. And I appreciate their value addition to the world so much that I would dedicate my own value addition to add value to their value addition. And that's not very different from love, right? If there's, if there's commitment and influence and passion, loyalty in that relationship, well, that's indistinguishable from love. So if we come up with a great definition for love, and love is a horrible word, by the way, it's the most, I think it's the, the, the most useless word in the English language. I use it with my wife all the time, don't worry. And my kids, I tell my kids I love them, don't worry. But you know what, I also love chocolate, okay? I love chocolate and I love my kids. And somehow those are supposed to both be described by the same word, that's ridiculous. Okay, so everything from a preference to a certain kind of sugary food to an undying love for a child, like, that is a massive spectrum of meaning, and it is a very difficult word to tackle. But we do have the experiences of loving people at work. And there's a lot of research around things like, like uh, empathetic connection among coworkers, even the concept of a work spouse, you know, the, that person at work who's actually your best friend and the person that you share everything with, and you might not share with your friends or neighbors, you might not even share with your actual spouse, you share your secrets with your work spouse. Well, that kind of trust and transparency doesn't develop without love. And it's a real love. It's not romantic. So I don't want to conflate this with romance or, or sexuality or sexualism. I don't, I don't think that's right. And I don't think, uh, I don't think we have to conflate love with romance because I love my kids, right? Obviously not romantic. I, I love my parents, obviously not romantic. And I love chocolate, clearly not romantic, right? So we don't have to conflate the two ideas of romance or sexuality uh, with love, but we can, we can tap into the, that concept and help to break down for leaders. Okay, if you want to live a life worthy of being followed, and if you want to be the kind of leader that's loved when nobody's looking, right, that is going to change the game for you, for your employees, and for your organization. Imagine, imagine how well your organization will perform in, in its competitive landscape when 15 of your core people really truly love you whether they say it out loud or not okay that's going to that's going to influence discretionary effort the number of leave days they take every year sick leave that's going to that's going to their quality of input seeking behavior like all of these things are going to be influenced by that and i really want to come out with a, a roadmap for and a, and a matrix for how leaders can pursue that kind of relationship with their followers because i i think i'm what i'm tapping into as I'm tapping out of professional distance, I think professional distance was manufactured and it's artificial and I, and I don't think we're wired for it. I think what we're wired for is tribal belonging and th that tribal belonging, knowing that we're with an economic community that's gonna provide for us and protect us and we're serving under a leader that has our best interests at heart. Those things, that's what we're actually wired for is let's get into an economic tribe now where we can trust each other and we can trust our leadership. And if we're really willing to uh, sacrifice for each other and die for each other, then how competitive can our organizations possibly be with not just that amount of raw talent, but that amount of passion?
right? That's what I'm trying to tap into. So it's, oh, okay. it's the, the basic progress steps are heard, understood, valued, and loved. And it's all about leadership in an age of empathy. So I'm sorry, in a nutshell, it's love at work. <laughs> love, love at yeah. work. Yeah, I just bit off a whole thing that I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm having I'm having trouble chewing on some of the some of the um, darker aspects of the concept, but I think it's a book that really needs to be written, and I do think it's the final frontier in empathetic leadership. Sure, I I get that completely. Well, yeah. anytime you need a shoulder to cry on, give me a call. <laughs> we'll we'll talk it through. See where that goes. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you do to get inspired? So you you have an idea one day and you think, yeah. okay, I'm going to fulfill another one of my purposes. So here's another one of my thoughts. I don't think we have one purpose. I think we have multiple purposes. I agree with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, so Cory Block wakes up one morning. Yeah. I'm going to extend my reach and I'm going to write another book. Yeah. Hell, I'm going to write two books. Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, just for the record, I'm writing uh, yeah. four. I'm writing four. Are you? Yeah, See, similar. it's addictive. It's yeah. addictive, right? It's like, oh, I've got all these good ideas. I just need to get yes. them out of me. Yes. I'm, I'm writing four simultaneously because yeah. here's the thing. When you begin writing a book and then by the time you finish writing that book, mm -hmm. I think you are a different person. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I'm writing four books and I want the same person to write all four books. Right. That's, that's right. why I'm writing four simultaneously. I like that. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So very deep, huh? Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> so like, honestly, let's, yeah. let's tack onto that for a second because sure, it's, it's sure. really important for us to recognize, right? You're, you're not a, a single person over the course of a life, right? You're a community. Yeah, absolutely. It grows over time. They're your eight-year-old self, your 18-year-old self, and your 80-year-old self, they all want different, they're all different Jeffs, and they all yeah. want very different things, right? They've got different priorities, right? And so you're you're stewarding all of the resources that younger Jeff created and gave passed on to you. And you have to steward those resources in a way that 80-year-old Jeff is gonna say thank you, right? And appreciate the effort that you put in and, and hopefully not incur too much damage as a result of whatever risks <laughs> you've taken. Indeed. Um, so it, yeah, so it's important for us to recognize I, I'm not the same person I was a year ago. I have the advantage of different experiences and more knowledge and more education and more networking and I have different people in my lives and, and in my life and that has impacted who I am and so my priorities are different, my thought processes are different and I'm not a single person over the course of a life but I'm a, I'm a community of gentlemen that, that occurs over time. And I think that's important because you're right, you know, if you want to write the same, if you want to write four books as the same person that you have to do them con concurrently mm -hmm. by the time you finish writing them you'll it's not that you're going to be four different people but that the next version of jeff is going to have the advantage of all four baskets of information yes completely completely yeah okay so here's my question we've spoken about confidence we've spoken about motivation and discipline yeah. so what do you do to get inspired so let me go back Cory Block wakes up one morning. I've got this great idea. Yeah. Maybe I'm going to write a book. Yeah. So what's your preparation? How do you get inspired to take on a project so, so big? I guess it is big mm -hmm. writing a book. Yeah. How do you get inspired for, for a big challenge, whatever the, that big challenge might be? Yeah, so I, okay, so two things. One, I ask myself, I create my why for that particular research phase or day, or whatever, and it's based on my curiosity. What am I most curious about today? If I could answer one question, what would it be? Right? So that's where I start. I start with my own curiosity because I find my curiosity is an incredible driver of, uh, of growth and input seeking behavior and quality decision making. So I start with my own curiosity and then I drop into flow as soon as I can. So flow is a, is a neurological state. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi did the research on this. Uh, I'm also doing research on the application of flow for busy managers, and that's part of the writing of my second book. But I've been using flow since I was 26. I completed almost my entire first master's degree from a single Starbucks uh, in flow. 
And I thought there was, I thought there was something mentally wrong with me actually at the time, because I would just, I would just lose track of time. Right. Suddenly yeah. like, I, and it really bugged me because I would order these, I would order a black venti drip coffee and I was sitting next to my laptop and I have my books here and I have my writing here and I get everything ready and I've got my, my starting question, my curiosity question to start me out. And then I would just write and read. And then I would reach out to grab my coffee and, and I'd take a sip and it would be stone cold. Cold. Yeah. I'd have this really disappointing experience. <laughs> like, okay. ah, it's so gross, right? But three hours had gone by and I didn't even know. Okay. So, so yeah. before we continue, perhaps, okay. perhaps we should step back and say, what is flow? Because people right. are saying, what? What I can't, I, I think I've experienced it, but yeah. how do I choose how and when to go into Perfect. flow? Yeah, it's something that I've actually become very, very skilled at now. It is a skill. You can learn it. Okay. The good news is actually most people have actually, most people have, have already experienced it. And one of the most common experiences that I've come across is when you drive home from work, you park your car and you have no memory of driving. Right. Most people yep. would think, oh, that was dangerous. It's actually not. You were at the peak of your human performance. And here's why. Okay. In flow, which is actually in the, in the uh, neurosciences called neurohypofrontality, when your prefrontal cortex shuts down, your brain moves from about 24 hertz to about 8 hertz, somewhere between alpha and theta, when you're very, very creative, but you have no sense of self, no sense of will, no sense of time. Okay. All of those things gone. Uh, so you're sitting in your car and you're driving and you're, you have no memory of it because your prefrontal cortex was shut down. If this is shut down, then the transcription pro process into your long-term memory isn't necessary. Everything just is translated into the back matter of your brain and you can compute things much quicker. Your, your prefrontal cortex, as powerful as it is, is actually a bottleneck in your brain, right? It's got about 120 bits of processing power, which is like seven items on a task list about a minute of video or two people talking so if you're if your wife and daughter are talking to you both at the same time that's it that's all your brain can handle uh trying to sort out what both of them are saying at once so it's a very powerful gear but it's got a low bandwidth and so if your brains learn like if we can shut that down and do all of our processing back here we've got billions of bits of processing power that's flow so whenever you hear athletes who've you know just broken a world record and running say oh man it just felt effortless well that's i mean obviously it's a common thing you hear athletes say oh it was effortless today it just it was seamless we just felt light it was felt it felt easy well that's ridiculous you just broke a world record like by definition you did something that no human has ever done before you describing it as effortless you're ridiculous okay but the reason they're describing it as effortless is because they don't they don't feel it they don't remember it it's in just, the, it's in the zone, they call it, don't they? Exactly right. In the zone. So I realized when I was 26 that I could get in the zone. And uh, my ex-wife, she used to get really irritated with me because I would be in the zone at home as well. And I would drop into flow. And then she would spend she would spend a full 30 seconds trying to get my attention. Corey, 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 Corey. And, like, and it would take, I would look at her. And she say that it would take fully at least 20 seconds before my soul would enter back behind my eyes again. And then she would say, there you are. Good. The kids are screaming. I need help. Right. And then I would, then I would have to break out of whatever I was doing and go. But the fact is that when you're in flow, you're so dedicated to the task. You're so curious about what's coming next and the, and the balance between your, your level of skill and the challenge that you're trying to master is like, it's right on balance. It's not, it's not so challenging that it's difficult, but it's not so easy that it's boring. And it's like, it's right there in that sweet spot. So whether you're surfing or you're playing Tetris or you're writing a book or musicians describe it when they're writing songs, anything like that, you can get it into flow in negotiations when you're like right at that sweet spot of challenge and skills balance. And that is flow. It's a neurological state. We all have access to it and we can learn how to get into it. So pay attention. If you've ever dropped, you're actually not going to recognize when you drop into flow. You won't, you won't know that you've done it. You'll only recognize when you wake up. Yeah. Right? By definition, you won't know. That's right. So you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll have this experience of going, oh, 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 yeah. I've totally lost track of time. And if you ever find yourself saying, I've totally lost track of time, 
pay attention. Okay. Look at your environment. Are you in a place where there's no noise, where there's a little bit of noise, where there's lots of noise? Are you in a place where there's nothing moving around or a little bit of things moving around or the TV on in the background? So you have a little bit of ambient, uh, ambient visualization. Uh, what kind of chair are you sitting in? What kind of activities are you doing? Pay attention because that you have earned the right to do whatever that activity is in a flow state. And that makes you 500% more productive than you would be in a steady state. Awesome. I do it many times, but you say it's a skill. You can learn yeah. how to do it and choose to do it. Yes. So, Kari, how do we do that? Well, again, like I said, pay attention to the times when you drop into flow, right? So uh, what I found is that environmental controls are really important. People like uh, different levels of um, audio stimulation in the background. And people like different levels of uh, visual stimulation in the background. So for example, I can't drop into a flow in a quiet room where nothing's moving. I have to be in a cafe. Or if I'm home, I have to have the TV on in my peripheral view with something moving around, right? There has to be something that's interesting to my visual cortex that's, that is sorting out. It's sorting out whether or not I need to, to see that. And it's always saying no, but at least it's triggering my reticular activation system and saying, okay, we don't need to pay attention to that, but it's at least it's, it's interesting. Same with my audio. So I have a, I have a playlist that I use. It's called trip hop. It works well for me. And I have a single song that I use to trigger myself into flow. And I've heard the beginning of that song more than a thousand times, but I've heard the end of it maybe four, five times, because mm -hmm. yeah, I have to actually discipline myself now because I've done it so many times. As soon as I hear that song, my brain goes, oh, yeah, flow time, right? And so it's moving to click me into that flow state. And the reason why your brain works with you to get into that flow state is because it is highly pleasurable and highly addictive, right? You're producing dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, anandamide. Like it's an amazing cocktail and your brain's going, yeah, the whole time. And so you, you'll, be, you'll finish a day of work having lost total track of time, six hours has gone by and then suddenly you're hungry, suddenly you're thirsty, but man, you've had the best day. And you can do that at work. You can do that with your kids. You can do that in art. You can do that driving. There's so many different ways to do it. So honestly, pay attention to your environmental protocol. What kind of environment do you need around you in order to drop into flow? What kind of tasks have you set out in front of yourself? Are you at that right kind of challenge skills balance where, it's challenging enough that it's interesting, but not so challenging that it's difficult. And it's challenging enough that it's, that it's, that it's interesting, but not so easy that it's boring, right? It has to be right there at that 4% level where you're, where you're taking a risk almost every second of that process to do something that you've never done before, just a little bit higher than, uh, than you've done it. So those are, those are the biggest tips. And then uh, get rid of your distractions. Right. I think the worst thing that we've well, the worst invention of the last 20 years is the smart smart watch. I hate that. It is it's just a breeding ground for distractions. Am I right? It serves no useful purpose whatsoever except to distract you. Its only purpose is to break your focus from whatever it is that you're doing to whatever it thinks you should do. And then on the other side of that thing, on the other side of your phone, is 10,000 engineers with 10,000 supercomputers, each of them smarter than you, all of them. All day, every day, they're looking for ways to break your focus. So turn it off and get it outside of your visual field. Because if it's inside your visual field, your visual cortex will pick it up and you will reach for it whether you like it or not. Because it's also a source of dopamine. So get rid of your distractions. Pay attention to your environment, what works for you, and pay attention to your task. Does that help? Uh, that absolutely helps. Now, just to give an example of how much I believe and I know this helps. If I were to go sit in a cafe and attempt to read a book, never mind go into flow, yeah. I would not have a prayer. Really? Would not, yeah, would really? not work for me at all. When I go on vacation, uh, I like silence. I don't mind nature, so I, I can I can lie in a sunbed, I can listen to the ocean, birds can land on my legs and whatever and and i can read i can go into flow gone wow but there's one vacation we went on and there was a dj around the pool my nightmare my absolute I nightmare I, I had to walk along the beach so far away that i could not hear Corey, i used to be a professional musician i love music yeah but 
when I choose to relax, I know the yeah. environment I need. Now, let me tell you how extreme you're looking at me now and I'm in a studio and I've had this studio built and it is soundproof. Nice. And we live, at, no, that's because I know for me to go into flow, I need isolation. Mm -hmm. When I guess it, boom, I'm gone because now I control my environment. When I go nice. somewhere else, someone sits next to me and you know, some people have got a really loud booming voice, you know, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, my not my nemesis. It's uh, I hear every <laughs> word they say. And my my frontal cortex is like interpreting and I'm thinking, <laughs> why are you telling the world what you had for dinner last night? I don't care. I want to read <laughs> my book, but I can't. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> so so I've gone to such an extreme because I know what I need to get into flow and mm. I've had built this soundproof studio. So amazing. That's Amazing. how important I'm not saying, Hey, look at me, I've got a studio. I'm saying that's how important it is to understand. Yep. Flow. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I, I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. And the science on this is amazing. And we're only, we're only just now, I think, tapping into the peak of human performance, mentally speaking. Yeah. Um, so on the, on the flow thing, I think this, it's a skill that's going to increasingly differentiate between high productivity and low productivity. Okay. Here's another one with flow. We have been talking on this show for longer than it takes to watch a Hollywood blockbuster movie. That's true. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I hope, I hope it was entertaining. <laughs> I'm never going to get an Oscar for this. Well, <laughs> for me, it feels like 10 minutes. So yeah. for others that they, they might switch on and off a number of times, but if you sit sat there and you say, Oh my God, it's longer than an hour and a half. Really? That's yeah. True. You, yeah, you, you were in flow, just absorbing. So pay attention yeah. to the detail, pay attention to your environment that's <laughs> allowed you to listen to Dr. Corey Block and myself just talking about stuff definitely for all <laughs> this time. So that's bringing us to the end of the show. I'm afraid for now, I'm sure you'll be coming back, but there is one Thank question you. that I ask every guest. Sure. Are you ready? I'm always ready. <laughs> I was born ready. I okay. was born ready. No, I wasn't born ready. I created this. Okay. I designed my readiness. Yes. Yes, you choose. I expect <laughs> yes. no less. So, Dr. Cory Block, yeah. what is the most important thing you have ever learned? Oh, that's a oh man. What do I choose from? The imp most important thing that I've ever learned is that I have the ability to design my life, and I choose what everything in my life means to me. Nothing in my life has intrinsic meaning outside of my ability to create it. So if I want it to be amazing, it's amazing. And if I want it to be horrific, it's horrific. But all of the meaning I have ever experienced in my entire life, I have created, which means I can create it. Nothing has meaning until thinking gives it so. Yeah, I Absolutely. create all of that meaning. Lovely. Okay. So just one more time, then people want to reach out to you. How do we get hold of you? Yeah, uh, www.coryblock.com. That's C O R R I E B L O C K.com. Or uh, on LinkedIn, you can find me with the same spelling, C O R R I E B L O C K. Um, if you just ask Google, Google is a pretty good friend of mine. Google will find me and direct you toward me. And if you mention Jeff Smith's podcast or the KPI guy, then uh, my marketing team will make sure to flag those those messages to me directly. Okay, and I will write back to you. Right? Oh, you're wonderful. Dr. Cory Block, you have been amazing. I've enjoyed every second much Thank longer you, than too. a Hollywood movie and far more value, of course. Thank you for your time today being sensational. And to you, the listener, thank you for listening to Secrets of Success. I hope you've enjoyed the show and it's ignited your passion to be a catalyst for action and giving you the fuel that you need to realize your own dreams. If you've enjoyed the show, please hit the like button. But more than that, here's one thing. Share the show. Share it with a loved one. Now we know the meaning of love. 
whatever that means. So just one person, share it, because this show could make a difference to someone's life and sharing it makes the difference to our lives. So Corey's dedicated his time, so have I, neither of us get paid. I don't take sponsorship, that's never the aim. All we want to do is to help you and nothing more. And we get to meet some good friends in the process. So all that we ask for you is that please share it with someone else. On another note, I'm always searching for great success stories. So if you'd like to be a guest on the show, or you'd like to nominate a guest, please contact me through the website at jeff-smith.com. You know, I really would love to hear from you. But that's it for today. Thank you again, Dr. Cory Block. You were awesome. And thank you for listening and have a great day. Thank you so much.